Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful to see everyone here today. I refer you to the back of our bulletin for some big upcoming events, activities. This is a really wonderful week coming up. We've got on September 25th our church picnic at the Haunt Farm at 2 p.m. If you want to be there, you want to bring something, we're going to have a start party afterwards. There's going to be swimming, there's going to be tremendously good weather, amazing food, and of course, the best fellowship in the world. So definitely mark that down. Saturday, 2 o'clock p.m. over at the Hawn Farm. And then the very next day, our 205th anniversary. Does it seem that long? Boy, we are gonna have some really special things planned for that day. We are gonna go through church history for our sermon that day with lots of special guests and lots of different things planned. We're gonna have some fellowship over in our fellowship hall afterwards. And taking a look at some of the, do I call them relics from the ages? And looking at some of the different things that have made this church so very important and so very special for so many people. Chicken barbecue, October 9. You definitely want to get your tickets because they are going fast, all right? So see we about that and get them while you can. If you want to talk to her today and uh, pick up some to hand out to your neighbors too while they're still here. So definitely talk to Lee about that. October 9th. October 17th, Make a Joyful Noise is now October 24th. Did I tell you that, Drew? No. No. Yeah, it's going to be the following week now, October 24th. So a little change in that, and we didn't get that in time for the book because we just changed that this morning. But that will be the 24th. However, Christmas Bazaar, set up in the Christmas Bazaar, have not changed. Those dates are still good, and you still want to be a big part of that. So lots of neat and interesting things coming up. Your prayer list, please keep those people in your prayer, and please add Nevaeh. Wave to everybody in the veil with her, with her hand. Yeah, she's got some wrist issues, and uh, we definitely want to keep her there. And Patty, it's good to see you today. Good to see you. And we seem to be walking well. Getting around. Yeah. Good. Hello, <laughs> Great. Good to have you. Thanks. Any other announcements? Anything else that needs to be brought to our attention this morning? Two men are out walking their dogs. One has a Doberman, the other has a Chihuahua. They see a restaurant. They're hungry, they decide to go in, but there's a big sign out front that says, no dogs allowed. Man with the Doberman says, I know what to do. Hey, follow my lead. And he pulls out a pair of sunglasses and he puts them on and he starts to walk in with the Doberman. Well, the waiter tells him, I'm sorry, sir, we don't allow dogs here. Man says, oh, I'm blind, this is my guide dog. He says, your Doberman is your guide dog? Man says, yeah, yeah, Dobermans, they're, they're really loyal, easy to train, they're protective, they're born for the job. Surprised more people don't have them. <laughs> that guy's skeptical, but he says, all right. All right, he lets him in. Well, the other guy seeing this thinks, oh, this is great. So he puts on a pair of sunglasses and he starts to walk in with his dog. And the waiter says, whoa, stop, we don't allow dogs here. And he says, I I'm blind and uh, this is my seeing eye dog. And the guy says, a chihuahua? <laughs> and the guy says, wait, they gave me a chihuahua? <laughs> Okay, today we're not here to talk about guide dogs and physical blindness. But we are going to talk about the kind of skepticism that our waiter had, and the skepticism, more importantly for us, that can leave us spiritually blind. The Apostle Nathaniel will be our guide today. He's the one who's going to lead us. 
So let us prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
confessing our sins unto God our Father, so we might be granted forgiveness. Lord in Christ, you gave us the light, yet so often we choose to walk in darkness. In Christ you offer us grace and mercy, yet so often we choose not to accept it. In faith we provide us love and leadership, yet so often we would go our own ways. Forgive us, Lord, and give us the courage and strength to live as you would have us to live. In Christ we pray. Amen. To all who seek forgiveness through confession of sin and the commitment to change, God responds with mercy and with grace. Ever and always, God welcomes us home to live with joy in the world and to look with hope toward the future. Let us now walk in truth, finding the freedom we celebrate in Christ's life and relying on the Spirit's power. These things we can all do by the grace of God. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 53 through 51. 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly, is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Then he added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join our human response. Take my life, God let it be. Number 448.
my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. How many of you know someone who is partially or completely colorblind? Seeing colors is something we frequently take for granted until we try to imagine what the world looks like to someone who cannot. One such person described the task of getting dressed in the morning as one of the more difficult decisions that he faces during the day. He admitted that there have been many times when he went to work wearing some very unusual color combinations. He was fascinated by his wife's ability to pick colors that go well together. What is most fascinating is how she notices that the appearance of a particular color in a piece of fabric can be changed by the colors that are around it. She'll hold up several different ties and say, oh, this shirt brings out the browns in the tie. This shirt brings out the blues in it. If you think about it, that very same principle is true in all areas of life. The diverse hues of ethnic heritage, religious background, cultural practices, they, they blend together, often in different ways, to give the fabric of life a lot of its depth, a lot of its richness. Of course, we're not always comfortable with that diversity. And so it frequently becomes a source of conflict as opposed to unity. It's also how we're blended together as God's people in the church. Each of us has an impact on the other. Where you've been this week, what you've done, what you've said. All of it has an effect on your life together as a people of this congregation. Both within and outside of the communities in which we live. So through each one of you, the impact of your community of faith reaches well beyond the four walls of this building, into public schools, consulting firms, doctor's offices, hospitals, boardrooms. In fact, the list of places you have touched this week, much too long to name each one. It involves each of your unique perspectives and values that you share with others. It involves your concern for each other and for what is going on in the world around us. It involves both your common faith experiences and the faith experiences that are just simply unique to each and every one of us. This linking together of humanity it's a characteristic of life, well, since the beginning of life. In our times, it's taken on what seems to be a new dimension. We now live in a global community through the medium of television, especially the internet. We have almost instant access to each other. No matter where in the world we live, it means that what's happening in a distant part of the world can now have an immediate effect on your life. Right here, right now. Whether we're talking about a, a celebration in New Zealand or a military coup in West Africa. We are indeed very much like a multicolored piece of cloth whose beauty and appearance is affected by who each one of us truly is and how we're woven into that fabric. Keeping that in mind, the morning's gospel story is about Nathaniel. He's mentioned only twice in the entire Bible, and then only in the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, well, they don't talk about him at all. They do talk about Bartholomew, in the places where John talks about Nathaniel. Since John never mentions Bartholomew, 
Our best guess is that Nathaniel and Bartholomew are one and the same person. Nathaniel was the fourth disciple, number four. According to John, Jesus called Peter and Andrew first, and then he called Philip. Then Philip went and he brought Nathaniel. His only other mention is with the other disciples at one of the resurrection appearances. Beyond that, we don't know a whole lot. He simply blended in with the others. So picture, if you will, our man Nathaniel. Like Peter, he is a fisherman by trade. He hails from Cana, another in a long line of undistinguished little hamlets in the Galilean region. The region itself is rather ordinary. The whole of Galilee is more or less uh, what you might consider to be a backwater region, noted mostly for a small lake, frequently called for a tourist attraction, the Sea of Galilee. And within this dull little province were equally dull little towns. Jesus was from Nazareth. Nathaniel was from Cana. The two were about 10 miles apart, just wide spots in the road, really. <clears throat> so here's Nathaniel, rather ordinary young man with all the hopes of any young man at that time to make some sort of difference in his life. And one day he's minding his own business doing whatever a fisherman do on their day off, probably stitching up a torn net or something. And his friend approaches. And today his friend Philip is really, really excited. He hasn't seen Philip this excited in quite some time. We found the Messiah, Philip says. The one we always heard about. The one we hoped for. He's here among us at last. We've waited so long. He is here. You've got to see him. Nathaniel, cautious at first, puts down his work. He has to admit his pulse is quickening. Could it possibly be, after so many centuries, would this great thing that they have hoped for for so long happen in his generation? Trying to remain calm, but his heart is in his throat. He asks, who is he? Where did he come from? Now here comes the embarrassing reply. He is Jesus of Nazareth. The son of Joseph. Now before the words had finished tumbling out of Philip's mouth, he could already notice the countenance on Nathaniel begin to fall as he starts to pick up his net again. Why couldn't it be David of Jerusalem or Elijah of Miami or some other exotic place? Why did it have to be Nazareth and a tradesman's son at that? Nathaniel scowled, fiddled with his sneakers, put his spectacles back up on his nose, started re sewing his fishing nets, said nothing. Philip waited. His presence to Nathaniel was, well, what do you think? Nathaniel looks up at his friend. Jesus is a podunk. So what? Can anything good come out of nowhere, Phil? Let me tell you three things about Nazareth, Phil. Three things. First, it's a really small town. What this country needs is someone from someplace important, 
Someone who can make the Romans sit up and take notice. Someone who's going to command the respect of the people. Nazareth. Nazareth is nowhere. No one is going to pay attention to anybody who comes out of Nazareth. Two. The second thing is my hometown is twice as important as Nazareth. And my hometown isn't important at all. Our football team beats there every year. Bat cats in Jerusalem don't even know we're even on the map. And the third thing, and the one that really says it all, Philip, Nazareth isn't even mentioned in the scriptures. Philip, how do you expect the Messiah from some place that's not even mentioned? In the Torah, not even mentioned in prophecy. No, 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 Philip. You haven't found the Messiah. What you found is another dreamer like yourself. Son of a carpenter who ate too much pepperoni one night, had a dream and thought he saw God. That's it. That's all. I'm sorry to be so blunt. I'm sorry to break the news to you. I'm afraid that's it. Best to just let this be. I'm sure Philip felt the perspiration running down his back. He's not going to argue with Nathaniel. For one thing, he really didn't possess the gift for instant analysis that Nathaniel did. So he knew that even if he tried, his skills of persuasion were not that good, and there's no way he's going to argue Nathaniel into seeing this any other way. So he just said, do me a favor. Come and see. Do that for me. That's all I ask. And everyone's surprised Nathaniel went. Trip sounded a little more exciting than fixing up the nets anyway. Jesus showed Nathaniel not who Jesus was. But more surprisingly, he showed him who Nathaniel was. Or actually, who he could be. In a single phrase, Jesus gave Nathaniel his first glimpse of who Nathaniel was. Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel never thought about it that way before. But you know, come to think of it, that really was who Nathaniel was. That, that's who he was. And he knew immediately he was in the presence of someone exceptional. Someone whose importance was a, a different kind than anything he'd known or expected. A sense of calling comes both from deep within and also from the unexpected source that lies without. It requires listening, even if we resist it at first. Nathaniel's preconceived ideas had to undergo a transformation. So let's put it together. What does Jesus' calling of Nathaniel have to do with the multicolored fabric of human existence? Nathaniel was a man in whom there was no deceit. In modern English, it means he's a person who sought to be honorable, who sought to be decent. He wasn't a prominent person, but he was a good person. A good person who tried to be a responsible participant in his community. I think that describes us too, doesn't it? 
Does not describe who you are. You're good people. I know you're concerned about and care for the world in which we live. I know we're diverse people, wildly differing ideas about how things in life should be accomplished. And we talk vigorously with each other about what courses of action should be taken in given situations. But that's all part of that multicolored fabric. That's all a part of our human existence. My point is simply that regardless of your ideas, regardless of your opinions, your motives, your motives are genuine. We could easily describe the, apply that description of Nathaniel to you. Persons in whom there is no deceit. I make a point of this because average people like you and me are often tempted to discount, especially the ordinary. And that's where I hear the story of Nathaniel speaking. God's will for history is not accomplished only by the elite or by the powerful. It's accomplished by the actions of ordinary disciples like Nathaniel and like you and like me. And you know what? That's something that we often forget and something that we, we really need to hear once in a while. We need to hear that our debates and disagreements about how to solve the injustices of life, well, they do have an effect on the course of human events. In a global community, it is easy to conclude we are such a small part of the picture we can't possibly have an effect on the course of history during our time. But our various gifts of ministry are often unexpected, even to ourselves. So I hope you continue to grow to see more in the life of your church than you really thought could be there. I hope you'll grow to see more and more as you open yourselves up to those new opportunities for ministry in the name of the one who calls us, no matter who we are, and no matter how inconspicuous we believe our talents to be. Our church remains alive. It remains thriving when we open our eyes and our hearts to the Messiah, to Jesus of Nazareth. May it always be so. Amen. This morning, Marcia gave me a Dewsbury cartoon showing a guy sitting outside with a pair of binoculars scanning the heavens, and someone said, what are you looking for? Looking for billionaires. <laughs> well, it seems we have three that have sent spacecraft up in the last two months. The latest one, Inspiration 4, especially meaningful to me on a personal level. I mean, the first two were suborbital flights that went up, they came back down, they were up in space for a few minutes at a time. Elon Musk took Inspiration4 and they went around the Earth three times. They went out further than the International Space Station. They didn't have to. Why? Because they could. And because astronauts have often said they went beyond where Hubble would be. You're so much further back, even another hundred miles, that the Earth shrinks down a little more to get to see more of the entire Earth that's a more pleasing view. The farthest astronauts have been since 2009. Four ordinary people going up onto this uh, spacecraft landed successfully. What makes it very special for me and my joy for today is that one of those astronauts, Sion Proctor, is someone I know quite well. She was actually one of my crew astronomers at the Mars Hat. And I got to meet her through that and uh, emails and communicating and working the observatories out there. 
when I was astronomy and Chile ambassador, she ended up in that same program. And we got a chance to meet and have some, get a chance to spend some time. And a very, very impressive lady. And I'm very proud that she was actually able to go aboard this thing and have that opportunity. My concern was that the last three days it's been cloudy and I couldn't see them going overhead. I would have loved to have been out there with my binoculars. I was all set, I was ready, and it was just cloudy, cloudy. And the last night, the third orbit going around, the skies cleared, and I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be iffy, but at 8 p.m., maybe we should be able to catch this, and I checked the orbital characteristics at 4 o'clock, and it switched and changed for some reason to 4 a.m., which I was actually even more excited about, because it would definitely be clear by 4 a.m. So this was going to be fantastic. And so about 1 a.m., I checked the orbital characteristics again, and there was no pass available at all. And then I thought about them, like, oh, they're landing tomorrow. So they're doing deep orbit burns and going into different. That's why the times have changed. And now with the last one, it wouldn't be visible here. But I did miss it. That, that's, uh, that would have been something really cool to see outside. But there will be others. And that's a very exciting part and time of life. Other joys and concerns that need to be brought to our attention today. Anything else? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to encircle us with your light and with your love, to strengthen us as we go out into the world to grant love to others, to discover the joy in serving, finding peace in disagreement, patience in suffering, kindness towards all people. Allow us to experience goodness even in evil times, faithfulness in temptation, gentleness in the face of opposition. Show us your way and let us live in the spirit of Jesus Christ. We pray that you strengthen us to make wise life decisions so we can participate in the processes of reconciling, building, healing, hoping. Through all changes in our life together, May we all be one in our allegiance to you above all and our trust in every circumstance. Our prayers are offered in the name of Jesus Christ as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
You surprised us by making us your friends. Your dance of faithfulness and life lies open before us in a way of unexpected grace, support, and joy. Take these gifts and bless them, and let them serve your people at home and throughout the world. Amen. Please turn to hymn number 172, Jesus Calls Us Over the Tumult. Thank you. 